Reformed Church. It, it is a funny thing, right, that Christianity today is seemed uh, or interpreted to be very divisive in this world, right? People, uh, and you hear that in the media, you hear that in a lot of places, especially with all the stuff going on today. Um, it seems, you know, that Christianity is just a very divisive thing, especially even to the rest of the world, the way they even see the United States, right? The way a lot of the world sees the United States as a Christian nation, even though in, in large part, obviously, we're far from that. But um, um, the, the thing, though, that you really recognize is, you know, this world itself, it's not, it's not Christianity. The world really is very divisive. In, in every way, right? The world divides itself in, by their financial uh, position. The world divides itself by the color of their skin. The world divides itself in all kinds of ways. In other words, th there are things I have seen, like you have also, right, seen, you know, racism and division at every single level. You know, if, if it's not, you know, I, I lived for a number of years in the Dominican Republic, and I was astounded. Like, I left the United States from when I was about 13, moved to the Dominican Republic, and I saw black people calling other black people racial names because they're lighter black than these are black. I'm like, what the heck is going on? I'm like, is, aren't you black? Like you're, and I'm hearing you like degrading another black person. But, but it's not, it really isn't. You know, I, I know that we put, want to put our finger on it. But, you know, the world will never be able to put its finger on it because the blame of it is sin and death, right? I mean, that, but the world doesn't know that. The world thinks that it's human beings, that, you know, it, it's, it's a black and white thing. It's not a black and white thing. It is a human sin thing, right? And that is why G Jesus didn't come to destroy racism. Jesus came to destroy sin, right? That he came to take the punishment for sin, right? It, racism is not the problem in the United States or in the world. Sin is the problem. In other words, it, and you, the, the, here, here's the thing, and this is, I think, how it'll come into maybe what I think the Lord has us for us this morning. Uh, th there, there are really just two kingdoms, and there is one single thing that divides two kingdoms, and that is faith. And that is the only thing that divides the kingdoms in this world is just faith. In other words, there, there, is, a, there is a kingdom of God or a kingdom of heaven, right? And the only way to enter into the kingdom of heaven is to have faith in Jesus. There is no other way. I mean, it's not, it's not intended to be divisive. It is available to every single person, no matter how old you are, no matter what race you are, no matter what language you speak, right? Jesus Christ saved the world, the entirety of the world, all of it, every single bit of it, every bit of the world that lived before or after Jesus, right? And, and if you have faith in Jesus... Right? We'll see that you are, you're translated, right? You've been, you, you are brought into the kingdom of God. You become part of that kingdom, right? Part of that reign, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, right? And then there is the rest of the world that does not believe, right? And that's it. There, there is nothing else. They, they, I mean, people try to make it about, you know, just like the devil and, and, and Jesus, but it, it's, it's just, it's more, even more clean cut than that, right? It's, it's either you believe in Christ and you enter into the kingdom of heaven, or you are part of the kingdom of this world and of this current age right now. And that's it. That's all, that's the only division that there is. And, and the awesome part about the Lord is that he wishes that no one should stay as part of the kingdom of the world, but that, he, that all would come and receive the reconciliation that he has already provided, right? God himself, the Father, has reconciled himself to the entirety of the world, not just the Christians, right? But he has reconciled himself. He was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, right? That means that he, he's, he's not angry at the world, right? God's not judging the world for the bad things that they do. The only reason why this is called an evil age, right, is because the evil is unbelief. Right? It just, it's the only thing. It's the thing that kept the people of Israel from entering into the promised land. It wasn't because they made a golden calf. It's because they didn't believe, so therefore they did not enter. Right? Hebrews clearly says that. Right? It was the, the only thing that prohibited the people from entering into the promised land was their unbelief in Jesus. That's it. It was no other unbelief. Right? And, the same, and, and we can say, obviously, Jesus, because the same gospel that was, is preached to us is the same gospel that was preached to them, right? The same escape from this world, this age that we have heard preached, right, through Jesus is the same escape from the age that they had, right? In other words, they, and you see even the symbolism, right? They escaped Egypt. 
Egypt is a picture of the world, right? They escaped from Egypt, and they were being brought into the promised land, right? But anyway, so, so, so what you see, though, is uh, you see a God, though, who desired to reconcile the world to himself. So he desires people to know him. So, so the, the fact that this world wants to go its own way and believes that, you know, the, the, you know the, it, it's not just about Jesus, you know, I can just believe in God, but, but it doesn't work like that, right? Humanity cannot look to God, the creator of all things, and say, I want to do it like this, and therefore you must accept my way. God is the one that made a way and says, you receive this way and come in. In other words, I made a way for you. If, 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 if someone makes a way, you know, it, it's funny, just, just, just a quick little analogy, not that it'll help that much, but there, if you're going to get on a plane, right, there is a gate, <laughs> and if you go to any other gate, you're going to end up in the wrong place, right, besides the fact that they're not going to let you on the plane, but the point is, there is there's only one gate to get to where you want to go, one gate. So you can't get mad at the airport, right? Because, well, you only made one gate. That's racism. Well, that's not racism. Made a way, right? This is, not, this is not discrimination. There's a way made. Come on. The plane can hold as many as will come, right? But if people don't come and they don't take the way, you can't get upset with the one that made the way, right? You got to get upset with yourself because you wanted to go your own way, right? That, that is the crux of the thing, right? And Romans 3 talks about that. The world, one, we have all, it says, apart from Jesus, including us, right? We had all gone our own way. In other words, people like to do what is right in their sight, right? What's right in their sight. That's why sometimes people come to church that hardly don't know much of anything about the word of God, and they hear you say something, and they're like, that's wrong. Like, what do you know? <laughs> like, how do you even know? Did God tell you that I was wrong? Like, how do you even know? But, it, because, but it's because it, sound, it sounds wrong to them, right? So when people, people want to go their own way. They want to do their own thing, and they want their own way to lead them to the promised land. But that's not how it works, right? It didn't work for the people of Israel. It doesn't work for us, right? You, there, there is only one way that God has made, but that one way, right, is accepting of every single person because it has nothing to do with us, right? That one way that he made has nothing to do with our behavior, has nothing to do with what we've done before, has nothing to do with what people talk about in our, my past life, I used to do this, right? It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter what sin, quote unquote, you've committed. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter any of that. The only thing that matters in this way is the blood, the cross of Christ that is, was the way that God reconciled the world to himself. That's what matters. And any person who's bitten by a serpent and looks at the, sna the, serp the snake on the pole, right, is made well. Anyone who just looks at the serpent on the pole that looks at the way and believes is made well, right? The, it, it's the same way with us, right? So it was when Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole, so it is with us, with us and the entirety of the world today. Anyone who believes, anyone who believes can enter in. Anyone who believes can enter in. In Hebrews chapter 2, if we can go there real quick. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 1. It says, uh, therefore, it says, we must give, and this is New King James, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed, in other words, to pay attention, to listen to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. This is applicable, you know, I, I believe this is really talking about people that don't, that refuse to believe the gospel, but there is most definitely application here also to us, right? Sometimes even though we know the truth, we can let the truth drift away, right? That happens to every single one of us. It could happen to you in one day. Today you could be very mindful of the gospel, and tomorrow you're just caught away with cares of this world and stuff that's happening, good or bad, right? And you, your mind could go, but um, it says, therefore, we must give the more, the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For the word spoken through angels. You heard that, right? The word spoken through angels. What is that? That's the law of Moses, right? And, and, and you'll, see, you'll see the contrast here in a second. But it says, for if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression, every transgression and disobedience received the just reward. In other words, the, the, the law was given... Uh, through angels. It was spoken through angels. And anyone 
who broke that law would pay the penalty of breaking that law, right? In other words, the law is like that. We know, we know laws, right? We got laws in the United States. You break a law, you pay the law. You break the law, you're condemned. You go to jail, right? In other words, there, are, there is a, a penalty, a price that people pay for breaking a law, right? That's called disobedience, right? Disobedience. If you go 55 and a 30, you're being disobedient. You may not like the word disobedient, right? Because today we don't like anything that tells you that what you're doing is wrong. We want everybody, even when we're doing wrong, we want people to tell us, no, that's right, because that's just your way of doing it. But there is right or wrong still. Even though people don't want to know right or wrong, there is still right or wrong. Anyway, <laughs> he says that every transgression under the law or, or disobedience, right, any sin or disobedience received the just reward. Verse 3 says, how shall we escape if we neglect, neglect so great a salvation. So, so the disobedience to the new covenant that it's going to talk about in a second that we're talking about, right, is neglect of that salvation. You see how simple that is? The problem with sin in the world today as, as it stands, in other words, the, the reign of sin and death in the world, in other words, you, you don't have to look very far, right, to see sin and death rampant in the world. I mean, everything corrupts. Everything decays, everything dies, right? That, that's called, when, when you see the magnitude of something like that, that's like, that's something reigning, right? If you were to go to heaven, right, you will also see rain. If you see, well, the, 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 the heaven of God, that is, right? Not just the heavens where there's principalities and authorities and powers, but the heaven of God. If you had your eyes open and you were seeing, right? And we, we have very, many examples in the word of what heaven is like, right? There is no death. There is no sorrow. There are no tears, right? It's not that there's, we're going to have a place like that one day, is that there already is a kingdom like that, right? Where there is no rain, no tears, no sorrow, no death, right? So, but that is also rain, right? In other words, there is a way that God does things and there is a way that this world operates, right? And they are diametrically opposed in every single way, right? They're nothing alike, the two. So, so he says here, he says, if you neglect the way that God has given into that reconciliation to him, in other words, if God who has made a way through Jesus Christ, through the cross, if people neglect that, in other words, that just means that people don't believe it. Because you know what? The truth is, there is a freedom that God gives every single person. That is, you can believe whatever you want, right? There's only one thing that's going to work. There's only one thing that will save you, but you can believe whatever you want. God doesn't force anyone to believe anything, right? God, doesn't, God is not a dictator, right? God doesn't make you get saved against your will, right? But if you, to all that receive him, to them he gave the power to become children of God, right? So here he says, he says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Now you can look at that in the negative and you can say, you know, how shall we escape? How shall we escape this world? How shall we escape corruption? How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? But you, you could also say, like we that do not neglect it, right? We have entered into and share in that salvation, right? And he says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by who? Not by angels, right? By the Lord. The Lord Jesus spoke that about that salvation, right? So the contrast is a law that's spoken through angels and a law that is spoken through Jesus, right? And then was spoken by all who heard him and believed him. And even unto this day, you're hearing it today, and you speak it as well about that same salvation that he first spoke of, right? So, so the, the, the debate within the church as to what covenant we should live under should be pretty clear, right? Do you live under the covenant that was spoken through angels or through Jesus? Just pick one, right? Because I know that it's hard for the church to believe that they shouldn't. It's not that we're saying, let's break the Ten Commandments, right? We don't get together here and say, hey, uh, do not commit adultery. Let's go out and let's all commit adultery. It's so much fun, right? That's not what we're saying. We're not saying go break it. We're saying that is not your obedience, right? But your obedience will lead to actions that are right and righteous, right? It's just that's not where your focus is, right? The focus of the law was on your works. The focus of the new covenant is his work. That's all, right? The focus of the law is your works. The focus of the new covenant by far has nothing to do with your work, and it has everything to do with his work, right? It's, it's a huge difference. But, but, but the new covenant that we are part of, right, was spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. 
God also bearing witness with both signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So you see, right, that when God performs a miracle, a work of power, right, when God performs signs and wonders through us, right, everything that the Lord does is to do what? To confirm his covenant. Constantly confirming and bringing our attention to his covenant, right, to his work. There is never a time where the church calls the church to bring attention to itself, the, 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 the Lord calls, right, for the attention to go to him. Now, sometimes, obviously, even though the Lord may be doing something to call attention to himself, people put the attention on the church. But ultimately, if you hang around the church long enough, right, you will understand that the one that the church is giving glory to and should only give glory to is to God, right, because it is God that works in us. It is God that works in us both to do and to will according to his good pleasure. So he is the one working in and through us, right? So all glory obviously goes to the Lord always regardless. But then he says in verse number five, and, and, and listen to the switch here for a quick second. I read it to you from verse one to verse number five. All that it, what it talked about there was the two covenants, right? Law, the covenant of the law that was spoken by angels and, and the new covenant that we live in that which was spoken by the Lord and continues to be spoken by us today. And then all of a sudden, it goes from that thought, and it's never disconnected, but it seems at first like it is a bit, right? It goes from that thought to verse number five that says, and he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. So now it switches all of a sudden to the world to come. In other words, to a new age. In other words, what that's talking about is not new age like people that lick crystals. In other words, new age speaking of the day to come where the kingdoms of earth and heaven will look like the kingdom of our God right, will look like heaven, right, where the reign of God now spreads, right, where the reign of God is no longer being done, is just, just in, the God, in the heaven of God, but the reign, his power and his glory then spreads to everything and everyone, right, to everything and everyone. Th that day in that world to come, he said, listen to how interesting that is, he says that world to come was not put, it's not subject to angels, in other words, angels in that world to come, right, that, that world, that age, the way it runs, the reign of it is not subject to angels. In other words, angels do not dictate how the kingdom of God runs, right? Angels are just ministering spirits, right, sent really to minister to us. So who is it that has the say in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven? Who dictates that world to come, how it runs? God, right, and Christ, God, first and foremost, right, and, and I'll just mention this because I don't think that we're going to get there, but there is the day that is coming, this world to come, is a day when Christ, right, will bring everything under his feet. Now, everything is already, everything is already, right, under the feet of Jesus Christ, right, but we don't yet see all of that, right? In other words, apparently, like we were talking about before, you see sin and death. Is this the kingdom of God? Of course it ain't, right? You don't have to be some kind of biblical scholar to know that, right? This is not the way the kingdom of God is, right? The way, the things, the, way, the way you see the world working today is not the way God runs heaven, right? So obviously, he ain't running it. That's simple, right? Who is running this earth today? It's not God, because <laughs> this isn't how we run things, right? In other words, if you go into a company and you see disorder and chaos... The reason why you see disorder and chaos is because of whoever's running it, right? And, and if you look at the way, if you saw the management style of our Father and God, you would know this is not his style, right? This is not how he runs his company, right? So obviously, when people say, well, you know, I'm mad at God, I don't believe in him because he doesn't do anything, you know, and he could do this. Well, you know what? The, wor the way this world runs today is not God running it. In other words, the will of God is not being done in this world. But guess what? He did give you a way out of it, though. If you want a way out of this age and you want a way into the kingdom of God, he gave you that way. All you got to do is take your ticket, which is the righteousness that he's given you through Jesus, go through the gate and get on the plane, right? And you'll be, you'll have, you'll be able to take your exit out of this world. Then you'll be part of the reign of God which what matters is how does he do things? In other words, in the reign of God, in the kingdom of God, which we are of, right, which Matthew 6 says that we should seek. We should seek after the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? We should be seeking after that. So what we should know is how does God run things? What is it that he's given me? How is it that 
he lives in and through me, right? So instead of looking at this world and saying sorrow, tears, death, decay, is that, is that who are we identifying? With the kingdom of this world or the kingdom of our God? Right? Because those are not the same things. But we people, even most Christians, right, identify with the kingdom of this world because that's what they see, right? That's the only reason why they do is because that's what they see. But the Lord says, don't live by sight. Live by faith so that you can understand and live in this world, but as part of his kingdom. Jesus said, I'm not asking you to take them out of this world. I'm just asking you to keep them by your power as part of your kingdom, but in this world. So aliens in this world, which we are, we can live just fine and dandy here, right? Why? Because we're part of a different kingdom, right? And we play by different rules. That doesn't mean that you disobey government, right? That just means, that, well, there are, there are times where the law of a land will contradict the law of God, and that's a different message, right? But the point is, on, on the norm, right, we are not called, obviously, as Christians to, to disobey the law of the land, right, because we're in this land right now, right? And we, we do obey authority. But we're going to talk to you in a second, though, that there is coming a day, though, where the Lord is going to remove all, all authority and power, right? But we'll talk about that in a second. But anyway... So going back to verse number five, he says, for he has not put the world to come, which we speak in subject to angels, but he has put that world to come subject to Jesus, right? So there is a day coming, and I didn't finish my thought there. There's a day coming where Jesus will, will visibly put everything under his feet. In other words, he will do away, and I'll read that to you in a second. He will do away with all authority and power, and when he does that, he's going to go to the Father, and he's going to say, Father, everything is now under my authority, Therefore, here you go, now it, is, now it is under your authority, right? Because Christ is under the authority of God. He is subject to the Father, right? And I'll read that to you in case we didn't know that, right? So, and he'll give that to the Father, and it will be subject to him. I'll show you that in a moment, right? But, so, but it has not been subject to angels. So we need as Christians to understand the way this thing works, right? This kingdom that we are of does not work by the law that was given by angels. We need to separate ourselves from that, right? That's not how it works. We're not called to break that law. It's just not the law of the land, right? It's not the law of the land. It's not the law of the kingdom of God. The king, in other words, listen to this. The kingdom of God where God resides in heaven does not work by the law of Moses. That should be as crystal clear as it could ever get to anyone, right? The kingdom of God doesn't have 10 laws plastered up next to the throne of heaven and God points to it with a scepter and says, obey that, right? That's not how the kingdom of God works. The kingdom of God works everything through Jesus. Everything works through Jesus to the Father. It's how the kingdom of God works, right? So we need to distance ourselves, right, from the thought that the government of the kingdom of God is run through 10 commandments. It's not the way it works, right? So good, that, that served its purpose, which was to bring us to Christ, put in, it's done, it's abolished, the law is gone. That law is kaput, no more. We don't have to argue about it no more. It is not part of the kingdom we are of today. Today, the law that we are of is spoken by the Lord, and it is called, the, our obedience is called the obedience of faith, right? In other words, to enter into this kingdom, there is one law, faith in Jesus. If you don't do it, there is nothing else, right? There is no Saint Peter who's going to come and at the gate and is going to either reject you or accept you. you. Right now, today, you are either saved or you are not, right? Saint Peter, or I don't know why they even call him Saint Peter, like, like we're not all saints, but anyway. The, the point is, right, he's not the one that is making the decision to allow you in or not allow you in, right? It is just faith in Jesus today that gives you that access, that righteousness, gives you that access or that righteousness, right? So, so again, so verse number five says that it, it has not been put under or, or been subject to angels, but, of one, but one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the work of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. In other words, whoever this one was to come, right? And that was written in, in the Old Testament, right? Whoever this one was to come, it was prophesied about him that he would be made a little lower than angels, that then he would also be crowned with glory and honor, and that he, individual, one person, would be set over the work of all of God the Father's hand, would be set over all the work of God the Father, right? By the hands of this one, right? By the hands of this one, 
everything would be put under his, under his uh, subject, I can say, to him, right? Subject to him. It says, you have put all things in subjection under his feet. His, H-I-S, one person, his. You have put all things in subjection under his feet, whoever that was. So then it goes on to say, since that was the prophecy, in, in, in the latter part of verse number eight, it says, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. In other words, that means, that means that every single person, thing that exists, any, any power, any authority of any kind, celestial or earthly, any power that exists, all of it is put under him. So there is a definite hierarchy, right, in the heaven or the kingdom of God. God the Father, God the Son, right? Those that are his and everything else, right? Those that are his and everything else, right? Everything would be put subject to him, right? And then it says, verse number nine, uh, sorry, no. Latter part of verse eight says, uh, that nothing is left that is not put under him, but now we do not yet see all things that it was just talking about put under him. So he's saying there, there's, there's a disconnect between what you see and what is. There's a disconnect between that, right? You do not yet see, he just said, all things are, put, are subject to him, but you do, you do not yet see all things. It didn't say no things, right? It didn't say no things. It says you haven't seen all things. That means that there are glimpses that people could get of things that are subject to him, and I'll talk to you about that in a second. And there are lots of things that you see that are not subject to him, right? But so that means that since there is a disconnect between what you see and what is, we are much better off, right, living by faith and understanding. In other words, living by faith is not living like this, right? Living by faith is knowing, right? Faith knows. Faith is not guessing or wishing. Faith knows Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you don't have faith. Faith is not, I wish, right, that tomorrow is going to be a good day. That's not faith. Faith knows. <laughs> and since you know, then you have faith. If you don't know, then you don't have faith, right? It doesn't matter what anybody else called faith. Faith is not a wish. Faith is knowing, knowing Jesus, right? Faith is knowing Jesus. So it says, verse number nine says, even though you don't see those things line up, it says, but we see, we we, not everyone, but we see Jesus. We see Jesus who, it says, was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. He was crowned with glory and honor, right? So we, we, we saw him fit the description of the one that was prophesied that the kingdom would come under subjection to him. In other words, the captain, the captain of our salvation that was to come came and was identified by being made lower than the angels. In other words, he laid down his glory and came in the form of a man. In other words, came the one who made the angels, right, came lower and made himself lower than even angels themselves, right? Made himself lower than angels themselves, right? Made himself, came in the form of a man in order to be able to die our death, right, then to be able to return to that glory, be crowned with glory and honor, and then have everything put under his feet. In other words, that was a phenomenal plan of God, right? To be able to bring the captain of our salvation, make sure that he was clearly identified through the same prophecy that was given of him before, is the same exact way that he came, made lower than the angels, suffering, came to suffer death, crowned with glory and honor. It says that, that he by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Miss Lindy was praying about that this morning, right? He said that, that he might taste death. In other words, he took death for everyone. So it was our sin, so it was our death that he took. But why is that so important, sin and death, that he took both of those for us? Because that's how the government of this world works. I told you about how the government of God works, right? The government of God works through the will of God being done perfectly, right? There is no death, right, in the kingdom of God. There is no sorrow. There are no tears, right? But the way this government, this age works today, it works, sin and death reigns in this world. In other words, that the way this world is governed, the governing thing or law, the governing law in this world is the law of sin and death. 
So he had to, in order to give us a way out of this world, he had to deliver us from that law. Because if there is one thing that God is, right, he is just, right? And if there's a law, you can't just break the law and live. <laughs> that's not how God works, right? God is not like, oh, you broke the law, that's okay, I love you anyway, come on. No, no, no. Every, every disobedience, every disobedience to the law deserves the punishment and the penalty for it, right? So, so we couldn't live, be under the law of sin and death, and then how do you enter into that kingdom without breaking this law? How do you enter into this kingdom, right? How do you enter, sorry, into that kingdom, the kingdom of God, without breaking this law? If I live under the law of sin and death, I can never get out, right? It says that, that we spent a lifetime being subject unto death. In other words, we lived with the fear of death every day. And, and you could say, well, that's not true, Pastor Jose. The world doesn't live with the fear of death every day. Oh, no? What is a bucket list? Why are people looking to retire? Because they're getting ready to die, right? Why do people get a plot, a will, right? All of these things are in preparation for one thing, that is to drop dead. Everyone is preparing to die. Every, that's how this world works, right? Everybody says, I'm not perfect. You know what that means? That means I sin. I do wrong, right? I'm, nobody's perfect. The world admits it, right? This is how I live, by sin and death. I may do things that are wrong, and I'm getting ready to die. Th that's, that's, that's called reigning, right? When we talk about rain, that's a rain. When you go to hev the heaven of God, you see a rain there. That's not the rain you see here, right? That, that's rain. So how did God get, a, get us there? Well, he had to deal with that law. He had to, and this is where, I know we say it very flippantly, he paid the price for me, but listen to what you're saying. <laughs> he paid the price for your sin and your death in order so that you could be delivered. If a, I mean, Romans 6 says, for the wages of sin is death, right? So what did God do? He eliminated the sin and had to die. In other words, it wasn't just sufficient for God to, you know, he, you can't just make an executive order and pardon all of us. No, 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 right? Someone's gonna die. You can't just pardon everybody. That, the, the debt has to be paid. Otherwise, we are still in debt, right? If somebody didn't pay your debt, then you're still in debt, right? But what did God do? He paid your debt. He paid for your sin and died, right? Now, he, he, now you're free, right? Now you're delivered. Now you're free. Now you've been delivered. So verse number, um, let's look, let's look. Okay, okay. Let, let's go from here then. Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 2. Let's take a look real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, sorry. I, I, we will get there. But let, let's go real quick. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12, and I'll give you the verse in a second. Uh, 10. Revelation 12, 10. He says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, which is the reign, right? The kingdom is the reign of God. In other words, the one who controls these things, right? And the kingdom or the reign of our God and the power of his Christ. You see how the kingdom of God works? It's the reign or the kingdom of God, and it works through the power of his Christ, right? In other words, every human being, every single human being without without uh, exception that is part of the kingdom of God came in through Jesus. There is no one in heaven that did not come in through faith in Jesus Christ, right? No one, not Enoch, not anybody. Everyone that came in, Enoch entered in because of faith. They may not have known his name was Jesus, but they had faith in the Savior, right? They had faith in the power of his Christ, right? So it says, now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. What, why is the, the accuser of the brethren not able to accuse anymore? It's not just because he was kicked out. It's because he has no basis anymore, right? He has no basis. In other words, it, Christ took our sin and our death. Therefore, that makes us 
blameless. It doesn't matter. The devil can't say, well, you see what they do? They're not perfect. They still do wrong things. It doesn't matter. (laughs) It does not matter. (laughs) Because the point is guilt. The point is condemnation. Can we be condemned for our sin? No, because he was already condemned. He can't condemn me when he was already condemned, right? So it's not whether we do things that are wrong. Of course we still do stuff that's wrong. We have never said that our outward actions are perfect. Far from perfect, right? But we have been, though, we have been made blameless. It says without a single fault. Why? Because God, who is the judge, right? Remember this, right? The devil is not a judge, right? He's just an attorney without a job, but he's not the judge though, right? He's just one that used to have a leg to stand on to accuse the brethren. He was right, right? He was right in what he did, right? Because no one had taken our sin yet. So before Christ came, he had a leg to stand on to accuse. After Christ has come taking our death, he has no leg to stand on anymore, right? There's no legal basis. God is just. He is the judge. How can you go to, to God, the judge of all, and say they're guilty? They should be condemned. No. The blood of Jesus to this day is the representation of our blamelessness, right? Of our no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because he sits at the right hand of the Father and he says, nope, he's wrong every single time. Every time. Even when you blame and condemn yourself, you ought to be looking at Jesus. People say that all the time. How should I feel when I do something wrong if I shouldn't feel guilty? How many times have you not heard, well, guilt, guilt is a good thing. Guilt is a good thing. You know, when you feel a little guilty, guilt is not good at all. It doesn't, never, there's no such thing as guilt leading to equal life. Guilt equals always condemnation. If you feel guilt, you feel condemned. There's no such thing as, I feel so guilty, but I feel so alive. No. You feel guilty, you feel condemned, right? There's death, right? Condemnation leads to death. There is no life that comes from guilt, right? But when he says you're blameless, when he says you're without a single fault, that leads to what? Life, right? Because you know what he's done, right? You know, you know what Jesus has done. So therefore, let, let's, just, let's just keep reading here just a little bit. It says, for now salvation and the strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of the brethren who accused them um, before our God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him, they meaning the church, overcame him meaning the devil by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. In other words, the word that we preach is the blood of Christ, right? The word that we preach is the cross, the message of the cross. So, so that's how, how do you overcome this world? Simple, right? And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith, right? Faith is what overcomes this world. Why? Because it is Christ who has overcome. You didn't overcome. I didn't overcome, right? The angels didn't overcome, right? Paul didn't overcome. Matthew didn't overcome, right? Smith Wigglesworth didn't overcome. Billy Graham didn't overcome. Joyce Meyer didn't overcome. Joel Osteen didn't overcome. Nobody overcame. He overcame. So when we put our faith in the one who overcame, that makes us what? More than conquerors. Makes us overcomers, right? How do we overcome? By faith in the one who overcame, right? Through the blood, which means death, the blood of the lamb. Death, right? We make that blood to mean some kind of weird thing, like it's some kind of ointment that you rub on your head, right? Blood means death. His blood was shed. That means death, not some kind of weird ointment that you put on your head, right? It's his death. It says, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and all who dwell in them. And it's funny because the next verse says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. You know that's not you, right? (laughs) The inhabitants of the earth. In other words, the people that are earthly, You are no longer earthly, but you are heavenly, right? If you have believed in the one who is the heavenly man, right, you have been made heavenly. You are of the kingdom of heaven. You ever heard of the kingdom of heaven, right? You are of the kingdom of heaven. You don't have to be afraid. It says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, it says, and of the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that his time is short. But I ain't afraid of him. He's just a lawyer without a job. Can't accuse me. He can, he can try and does try to make the people of this world feel less, less, makes, the, makes this world feel guilty, makes this world feel worthless, right? Do you see, right, the way that this world works with sin and death? He always, the, the plan always is to make people get to a point in their lives where they feel worthless. And you know what people do when they feel worthless, 
right? They take their own lives, right? When they feel worthless. Or, right, they go the opposite way and they try to make something of themselves, right? But you, you notice that sometimes when people talk, they talk about accomplishments, right? Or they talk about where they're going or they talk about what they've done or they talk about their bank account, right? Because they're trying to lift themselves up out, up out of the muck and mire, right? In other words, I need to distinguish myself from these things, from these people, right? But the thing is, you can't lift yourself out of that. You, you can try to get up as high as you can, and you're still part of the same world, same sin, same death. There is no escape out of this kingdom, right, of the world except through the way that God made for us, through Jesus, right? So, so people try to lift themselves up, but you know what? It doesn't matter how clean you try to get, you're still part of the same mess, right? Still part of the same mess, but the good news of that, right, is, and that is the good news that the Lord has given us. It says he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, he's put a word in our mouth to say there is a way out of here for everybody. You ever watch a movie and every time there is a way out, it's always like just a few make it and everybody else drowns, right? There's a way out, but, but th there's no hidden agenda here, right? Everybody can come. When? Right now. Is there a limit? Is the whole way too narrow? Nope. Everybody can come. Right now, everybody can get out. Every single person can get out. Who can't get out? The ones that don't want to come. Right? If you don't want to come, you can't get out. But, th but that's basic reasoning, right? You cannot come. Even in, 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 you, you may want so badly to get out. In other words, I believe with all my heart that there are people that want to get out of the situation that they're in. They want to get out of the abuse that they're suffering. They want to escape the pain that they're in. I totally believe that. But even though they have a strong desire to want to get out of this thing that they're suffering, which, listen, even people that don't believe in Jesus want out of this suffering. Everybody does. There is not a single person on planet Earth that does not want to escape the corruption that's in this world, unless you just love death and you love corruption, which nobody does, right? Right? Everybody wants out of it. But the thing is, no matter how much they want out of it, right? if they don't believe in the good news, now what happens is sometimes the church doesn't present it as good news to the world. In other words, what the world, well, a lot of times what the world hears is, clean up your act and then you'll be able to come. But the thing is, they can't. Stop telling people to clean up their act and then come. They can't clean up their act. That's why the world is in the mess that it's in, right? And that's why it needed a savior. That's what the law needed to show the world, right, at the time. Look at, look at the standard of God. This is the standard of God. Keep it or die. And he wanted the world to understand that they couldn't so that they would look a different way and say, how about a savior? Can we have one of those? Because this thing, I can't do it. When the, Lord, when the Lord heard the people say, we don't want to hear this law anymore. We don't want to hear it mentioned. We don't want people to read it to us anymore. We don't want it anymore. God, you know what he said about that? He said they're right in what they said. They are correct in what they're saying. Because the Lord's desire was to turn people from their own performance to a place where they could say, you know what, Lord, I just can't. That's a great place to be. When people say, I can't, right, that's awesome because that means you're ready for a savior. You can't, good, somebody already did. You can't, good, somebody already did. Somebody already did. That's, that's, that's awesome news. That is awesome news for any person that can breathe, right? Sometimes people, you know what, they, they oh, I don't want to hear about Jesus because they think, you know, of course they want to hear, right? In other words, well, I'll say it like this. Of course they need to hear what you have to say, right? Of course they need to hear what you have to say. It, but but they, they give you a facade, like, no, nah, no, nah, like, I'm good. Like, I'm, you're good what? You're good in your death and decay and destruction? You like that? Of course they don't, right? It's just that they don't know, right? That, that's why this, call, this kingdom is called the kingdom of darkness, right? Darkness meaning not that everything's always dark and that it's always nighttime, but darkness meaning they don't know right? Ignorance. Even the smartest people of this world, the, 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 the wisdom of this world, it says, is foolishness to God. But the funny thing is, the, the wisdom of God sounds like foolishness to the world, right? But, but why is that? Because the world, in all of its wisdom, could not get enough wisdom 
to buy that wisdom know God. You cannot attend college enough to know Jesus. Nobody can teach you Jesus, right? The Spirit of God has to reveal himself to you. You can go to Bible college, right? But that doesn't mean you're going to know him. It just means you can know a lot of verses, but that doesn't mean you're going to know him, though. If, if you don't look for him and he doesn't reveal himself to you, you know nothing, right? So, so there is nothing that the world could ever do. As much as they like to seek knowledge, you can never do enough seeking of knowledge or wisdom to be able to ever say, I figured God out, right? But, but you know the cool thing is? It's so much easier than that, right? He didn't make it so that we had to figure him out. He, he made it so that he would reveal himself to us, right? He makes himself known, right? Even if you're not very smart, even if you don't have a really high IQ, right? It doesn't really matter, right? The truth of the matter is that when we're, you're talking about the wisdom of God, nobody has a very high IQ, right? Because nobody can just know God by themselves. So therefore, there are no really smart people, right? God doesn't look at you and say, ah, oh, you figured it out. You know me. I, I, you figured it out. I know. No, nobody can say that. Nobody figures him out, right? You have to be taught him by God. Nobody figures him out. So in other words, so we're all at the same level of ignorance. We all know nothing, right? And then when you're taught him, now you know something, right? Now you know something. So, so of course, there's value, right? in going to school. Like naturally speaking, there's value in going to school, there's value in having a job, there's value in all of these things, right? God can add all those things to you. It's just, but let's, when it comes to our seeking though, what you're seeking, and Pastor Mike was talking about that during pre-service, right? When it comes to your seeking, it says seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added unto you. It's not, it's not that God doesn't, see, because the church is a little confused. It's either God or I have nothing and I have to dress like I have nothing and I have to live like I have nothing. And, I have, and that's what they think humility is. It's like having nothing and depreciating yourself and being just looking like nothing, like you need a shower every day, right? Like you, you, you always look dirty. You always have need of something. You look homely, right? But that's not what he's talking about, right? He wants us to have everything, but he wants to add it. He just wants you seeking to be in him. Just seek me. He said, now everything he says that the Gentiles seek after, in other words, what this world wants, I'll just give it to you. That's a cool thing, right? I'll add it to you. I know it, it sounds too good to be true when you're just looking with natural eyes or natural ears, but it is true, right? All right. We got a high speed and then wrap up here. Um, so so the, the, the important thing I wanted you to take out of Revelation chapter 10 is that the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. What did I say, though? The kingdom of God, right, is the kingdom of heaven. Everything that's done in heaven, the way the kingdom of God works is no tears, right? No sorrow, no death. Jesus and the apostles, and we're telling you today, and you've heard before, the kingdom of God, his reign, the way his government works, has come to this earth. To this earth. The way of governing that God has, has come. And the Lord says, I get it, though. I know you don't see it all, right? But it came. It came. Matthew chapter 7, I think. Or, or Luke, let's see. Let me find it for you. Luke 17, is it? Yeah. Luke 17. Let's go there real quick. Luke 17. Luke 17 and verse number 20. It says, when, when he was asked, Jesus, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, you see what he was being asked from them? They were told and had heard. These are Pharisees, right, that read Scripture, right, and rewrite it. The Sadducees would rewrite and rewrite and rewrite Scripture, right? They didn't have copy machines. It's just people writing it over and over again, right? So they, they knew it. They searched the Scriptures, right? They knew it. And they knew that the kingdom or the reign of God would come. But they, they wanted that, right? Because the, this really stinks. <laughs> we want you to come and reign over us. And their mental picture was, today the Romans may reign, but tomorrow God is going to come, and he's going to reign over us, and then he's going to be really mad at all of you, right? So they were asking Jesus, if you're saying the kingdom of God is near, when is it going to come, right? That's what they wanted to know. It's a good question, right? It's a good question, and he gives a good answer. He says, the kingdom of God, he says, does not come with observation, with ocular evidence, Right? The kingdom of God does not come with your eyes proclaiming that it has come, right? That's not how it works. 
In other words, the reign of God from heaven does not come into this earth visibly, right? That's not how it comes in. The, king, the effects of the kingdom of God can be seen, but he's talking about how does it come in? How does it come in? And what he says is it doesn't come with observation where you can say, see here or see there. So clearly you cannot point to it, right? Finally, like, 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 like kind of like the way you would see a, a huge land mass or a UFO coming into the earth and the clouds splitting and here it comes and it just lands and squishes everything, right? That's not the kingdom of God is going to come. It doesn't come like that. It's not going to be a big mass of dirt that's going to come and overlay the earth, right? You, you, you're never going to be able to point to it like that. But he says, you can't say see here or see there for indeed the kingdom, the reign of God, the way God governs in heaven, that reign is within you. In you, in, in, <laughs> right? The rain that we've been talking about this whole service long, he says, is right on the inside of you. But now, now we're confused, right? Because if, if the kingdom or the reign of God is how God does things in his reign, how he governs, it's in me, on the inside of me, it's in me, right? Exactly, right? Because what happens is, what happens is, and, 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 and I'll explain it a little further like this. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. And we're probably going to be wrapping up there, I think. Right? Ephesians chapter 1. And um, I'm thinking like around 18 or 20, but we'll see. Ephesians chapter 1. Um, let's just read from 15. It says, therefore I also... Paul's writing by the inspiration of God. He says, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, right? Like we were saying before, you don't learn God, right? By the spirit of God, you receive wisdom and revelation of who he is, right? That's how it works. He says, the eyes of your understanding, right, your mind, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, no longer darkened like the kingdom of this world, right? The kingdom of this world is the kingdom of darkness. Colossians says that he's translated out of, a, out of that kingdom and into the kingdom of the son of his love, right? So he says, being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance that's in the saints, the kingdom that's in you. He says that you would know, remember, seek first, Matthew 6 says, 33, right? Seek first the kingdom of God. He says it's in you. Seek first, like make your seeking while you're here present on this earth. Make it the kingdom, the reign of God. And guess what? It's in you. So seek what's in you, right? Seek what's in you. That's the, the, the whole series that Pastor Mike is, is drawing up for our little kids is, did you announce the title of it already? People know that? No? Okay, well, you'll see it, but that, that's about them coming into what they have, right? Coming into what they have. So he says, uh, being enlightened that you may know the hope of his calling, the riches of the glories of inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? It shows you right there, the only qualification, you believed. That's it. What did you do right in all of your life? What did, what's the one thing you did right? You believed. And that brought in a flood of the grace and glory of God, right? According to the power, the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. It says, and now, now li listen to this. He worked in, he, the work, working of his mighty power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. Now, keep this, keep this in your mind for a second. Jesus came and was prophesied that he would come a little lower than the angels as a man. But then he would be crowned with glory and honor. So he returned, in John 17, he describes how it would work, right? But he returned to the right hand of the Father. That means that he is seated, and he's going to tell you in a second here. He says he's seated far above, seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. Watch. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. That's called, right, everything being made subject to him, right? Everything is under his feet. He's set above it all. So in other words, there is nothing in this world that has authority over him. There is no demon, not the devil, not all of his angels, not all of the, the six heavens beneath the heaven of God or anything in this earth that Jesus answers to. In other words, that he is subject to. 
That, that, in other words, that he would say, that Jesus would say, I must die. Why? Because I am subject to the law of sin and death. He's not subject to that anymore, right? He lives, he, he, is, he is, res, resides at the right hand of the Father, and he's part of what? Of the kingdom of God now, right? Jesus Christ is part of the kingdom of God. So he has been lifted up. See, now, he came lower than the angels. Is he lower than the angels right now? No, right? He's above all the angels. He came lower than the angels, and he's seated now at the right hand of the Father. So he is above all angels, principalities, power, ab above the law of Moses. The law of Moses has no dominion over him. The law of sin and death has no dominion over Jesus, right? None of it does. Why? He's above it all. Everything is under his feet, right? That's clearly established. We know that. The church believes it, hopefully, right? That, that's, that's the truth, right? And then watch now. Watch now. And then it says, verse 22 and he put all things under his feet, which we just said before, and gave him, watch now, watch, gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So he is, the one who is above everything is our head, right? Our head. The head of this church and every church across the world, right? Christ is the head of it, right? Which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now watch, chapter 2, verse 1 says, remember he's above everything, right? He's part of the reign of God, the kingdom of God, right? And lives, right, lives subject to the Father and subject to all his will. In other words, the, the heaven of God works according to the will of the Father, and Jesus is subject to him. That means that all the goodness, all the good, all the power that the Father has, has attributed to him is him's and his, and no one can take it from him. No one can, can do anything to remove anything from that, he, that he's been given, right? No one. Verse 1 says of chapter 2, and you, it says, he made alive, who were, were dead in your sins, were dead in your sins, were. You see now that law, that reign of sin and death, kind of, it's getting, it's losing its grip a little bit so far in this chapter, right? It's losing its grip a little bit because it says you were dead. Law of sin and what? Death. Sin and death. So it says it's losing its grip a little bit. You were dead in your sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world. In other words, you used to walk according to the reign of this world. Sin Death, corruption, destruction. In other words, you were subject to it. It says, it says all our lifetime we were subject to this world and we lived with the fear of death always, right? That, that's, that, that's the way everybody lives. Everybody in this world lives that way, right? Now, if, you, if you're an inhabitant of the world, right? If you are from this world right now, if you're earthly. But here it says of you, you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, Right? That's, that, that's his little playground, right? Nothing to do with you, though. You know why? Because it has nothing to do with him. <laughs> it has nothing to do with him, right? Jesus could give two hoots about the prince of the power of the air. His authority means nothing to him. Nothing. It means absolutely nothing. It doesn't, it doesn't take away from him. It doesn't do anything to him. It doesn't move heaven. It doesn't shake the heaven of God. It does nothing. Everything you do down there has nothing to do with the position that Christ has. But it gets better, right? Because he says that that's how we used to live, though. According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of who? Disobedience. What is the disobedience that we said before? The disobedience to the law, right? was not doing it, your performance. If you failed it, you were disobedient, right? Today, the law of God, which is faith, the law that was, the covenant that was spoken through the Lord has one law, faith. It says, it says that that spirit, the prince of the power of the air, can only, only work in the sons of disobedience, which, which means, right, those that refuse to believe, those that neglect so great a salvation, right? And it's not because God wants it that way, because I already told you and made that clear, right? That's not what God wants. God's will is that none should perish. So let's not get mad at God. Let's get mad at the devil, right? Let's not get mad at God. Get mad at the devil and say, you know what? I'm leaving. That's what we ought to tell the devil. You know what? I want a divorce. I'm leaving. And look to God and say, I want to marry you, right? And do that instead. 
Don't get mad at the one who doesn't want you there, right? Who doesn't want you to be a son of disobedience, but wants you to be a child of God, right? That's clear. Among whom also we all once, once, not today, once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, by nature we were children of wrath, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, even when we didn't even merit it and couldn't do anything for ourselves, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And watch now. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What did he just do? Where Jesus is, right, where, where no No power, no authority, none of that has any dominion over him whatsoever. He said, that's what I did for you. I raised you up and sat you with me in heavenly places. How can he say that? Because the kingdom is in you, right? Kings sit, sit on their throne, right? Kings, in other words, the kingdom of God is not something that is far from us. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, is within you. So we are seated with Christ, who is the one that lives in you, by the way, who's come to make his abode in you in John, he said, right? Lives on the inside of you. You have been already seated with the Lord, right? Heaven is on the inside of you already, already yours. You are already part of a kingdom where there is no fear, no death. You know what happens in Revelation 21 when he talks about that? In Revelation chapter 21, I, I, I think I probably wrote it down, but you know what? If not, I'll just go there real quick for you. In Revelation 21, he says, um, he says in verse number one, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. You know how cool that is? That it doesn't say, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And it says, and, and all the Christians were made new. No, <laughs> that's 2 Corinthians 5, 17, right? All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You were made a new creation in Christ. All you're seeing now is the rest of the world is getting what you got. What he saw, right, what he sees, right, in this new world that is subject to Christ, here's the punchline, right? Just as the world to come has been put subject to Christ. So Ephesians 5, right, says today that we, right, that the church is subject to Christ. Right? Just like uh, uh, it, says, it talks about a, a husband and a wife submitting to one another, right? So it says in Ephesians chapter 5, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll read that to you so you, you know I'm not making it up, right? Ephesians chapter 5 says, Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, just as the church is subject to Christ, so wives ought to subject themselves to their husband, right? But you see the thing there, right? We are subject to to him. If you're subject to him, that means you're part of his kingdom. The, what is going to be the effect in Revelation 21? You already know what's going to happen, but I'm, I'll read it to you. What's going to happen when he makes the earth and the heavens, not, not the heaven of God, obviously, that, that's as new as it gets, right? But all the heavens below, right, where principalities, powers, and dominions dwell, right? Heavenly things, right? And, and the things on this earth are going to be made new to look just like. In other words, the kingdom of God is going to spread to all the heavens and to all the earth, right? When that happens, what does it look like? It looks like just like everything that just happened on the inside of you, right? It looks the same way. In other words, what the newness, the newness that the world is going to get is going to spread and come actually from the inside of you. That's a whole different message, right? And I had some references, but we don't have time for that right now. So he says, but now it says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. That's the exact same thing it says about you, right? When you were made new, old things have passed away. The heavens and the earth, everything that you see around you, you're not going to have to say anymore, everything that I see is not subject to Christ, but I am. Then you're going to be able to say, I'm subject to Jesus, and now so is everything else, right? The knowledge of God is going to fill the earth the same way it's filling your mind today, right? The same way the knowledge of God is filling your mind, and that's all that we seek after is the knowledge of God, to know him and the power of his Christ, right? That same knowledge is going to fill the earth, and by consequence, right, that same newness that you have will come into the world. It says, then, it says, it passed away, and I also saw no more sea, 
Verse number two says, then I, John, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. In other words, there is a day coming also, right, where people right, will know in full. Pastor Michael was just preaching about that on Wednesday, right? Where when the knowledge of all Christians are full, even Christians that didn't want to believe what we were teaching today, right, will know fully, and guess what? Then all mortality will be swallowed up by immortality. Why? Why is it that the immortality that you have in you will swallow up the mortality that is outside of you? Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the things of the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood cannot, that's not how God reigns. The reign of God says immortality, right? This thing doesn't want to be immortal, so God will make it immortal. That's called the heavenly body, right? Something that will live and subject itself to the immortality that is of the reign of God. God says in his kingdom it's called eternal life. In the kingdom of this world is eternal death, right? The kingdom of God is eternal life. So what is he going to give your body? Immortality, eternal life. That's what people should hear through the gospel. Immortality, that we have been made partakers of heaven in you, of the kingdom in you. That's why the Lord says seek it. Go after it. Seek that kingdom. Why would God ask you to seek a reign of his that you can't do anything with? Seek it for what? Why, why, why would he tell us about this? Thing? Seek first the kingdom of God. What am I going to do with it? Right? Is it like a dog chasing after a car? He's never going to catch it, and he don't know what to do with it if he caught it. Right? But that's not us. Right? When we, he tells you to seek after the reign of God, he said, use it. Take it. Right? Let, let it transform and renew your mind, and it will transform your lowly body, right? Let it renew your mind, and it will transform your body. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says, um, verse number three, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle, right, or the habitation of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and uh, God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death and no more sorrow, no more crying. You see what it is he's saying? When your knowledge is full, right, the, the leftover remaining effects that you, we people, we, we still suffer from this world will be done away with. But you know the good news about that is? The more even today that you get to know him more and more and become a partaker and a seeker of that reign of the kingdom that you are of now, the more that, that the way that God governs, the way his kingdom works, which is that you don't see tears or death or sorrow or crying. He said, there shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. All of those former things are the same former things that have passed away from you already. And I get it, you know what? And God gets it too. Because you're saying, yeah, yeah, but I don't see that today. We already addressed that, right? He says, I know. He says, I know that you do not yet see all things subject to me. See, listen, here's where we'll end. Let, let's just turn this around for a second. I'm going to close this so you know I'm ending. We always make it about us. Lord, but I don't see these things really coming to pass in my life. I don't see it happening to me. But no, turn it around. God is saying, I know you don't yet see everything, including your body, completely subject to me. In other words, if your body is subject to me completely, you would see that your body would be fully transformed. Because when I touch something, it turns to gold, right? When I touch something, it turns to gold. So the reason I know, he says, I know that you don't see it. But he says, but I do know what you do see. You do see me, though. And you know that I was made a little lower than the angels, right? That I came and suffered your death. And that I have seated you with me in heavenly places. And I'm asking you, seek that reign. Seek the way I govern and the way I reign, right? The way I govern over things. Seek my government. Seek my way. And you'll see that you'll have life, right? He knows that we don't see it all yet. But he asks you and implores, right? Do not live by sight. Living by sight will kill you, right? That's, how, that's why the world is dying, because it lives by sight. We, don't, we have faith. We don't have to live by sight. L live seeking first the kingdom of God. And you know, I get it, but you're saying, but I need a career. And you're saying, I need a job, and I need money, and I want this, and I want that, and I want to get married, and I want to have this, and I want to be a good that. And I he gets it all. <laughs> he gets it all. 
He gets it all, right? He said, I told you I was closing it, but I'm opening it again. Matthew chapter 6, and we are going to really end here. I'm, I should stop saying that because I keep lying. Okay. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33, right? Matthew 6, 33, or 31. He says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows, I know that you have need of all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God, my reign and my righteousness. And all of these things that the Gentiles seek after, right, they'll be added to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble, right? The Lord just says, seek, seek, seek my kingdom. See me, right? So the cool thing is when your mind tells you, I don't know if that's true because I don't see it. He says, but remember, don't forget though, but you see me though. The world doesn't see Jesus, right? But we see him. The world does not see him, but you see him. You know what he's done for you? You know the kingdom that he's put on the inside of you? He says, you keep growing that way and you'll keep receiving. He says, therefore, since we're receiving, Hebrews 12 says, he says, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, we're receiving the kingdom in us out here. Since we're receiving still a kingdom on the outside, manifestly, that is an unshakable kingdom. So you know that's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Everything else is shakable. Everything else is corruptible, right? He says, let us have grace then. The Lord is saying, just, just take what I have given you. We hope you enjoyed this message from Reform Church. If you have, please share this with someone else and help us get this uncommon truth out to the world. If you'd like to support this good news, you can do so at reformchurch.com slash give. Also on our website, you can take advantage of our free messages, articles, and even full discipleship courses. Start reforming your mind now at reformchurch.com.